Well, hello again, it's Ken Colson here from Creation Unfolding. And uh, today we're going to be talking about phylogeny and cladistics uh, in relation to taxonomy. So, of course, uh, the Linnaean uh, system of taxonomy was what was used pretty much uh, in the uh, early 1800s or so. Um, but it was in about the sort of 1950s after the advent of Darwinian evolution in the 1800s, the mid to late 1800s, that scientists wanted an evolutionary classification system that connected all of the evolutionary dots. So since, according to Darwin, uh, all organisms descended from some uh, common uh, ancestor, then scientists should be able to link all organisms with their evolutionary counterparts. Now, importantly, uh, Darwin believed that uh, natural selection uh, worked on already existing biological parts. It didn't replace them, it worked on those, uh, modifying them, hence the idea of uh, descent with modification. Now, this hypothesis then became the basis for building phylogenetic trees or clades that linked uh, all of life's organisms um, to their ancestral ancient counterparts. Now, scientists concluded that uh, modern forms should retain primitive features based on that hypothesis. So all a scientist has to do then is to sort of look at a suite of uh, organisms and find the features or traits uh, that are common uh, to all of them. Uh, these features would then represent the primitive state. So here's a, a suite of organisms, um, just kind of a random suite. We've got a goat, a frog, a lungfish, a lizard, and a bird. Now, this is the particular suite uh, that we're working with here. These are these creatures. Um, and so uh, each clade is going to be relative dependent on the animals that you have. So in our suite, uh, we have, for example, uh, shared traits that are jaws, a skull, two eyes, and a backbone. These seem to be the most obvious traits that all of these creatures share. So we would call these features, we would call those our uh, primitive features. Uh, these then, these features would become our starting point for this suite of organisms. So next, what we want to do is we want to look for traits that four of these uh, creatures possess that the fifth one doesn't. And in, of course, in our suite of animals here, of course, the kind of the one that st sticks out, the trait that sticks out, is uh, the possession of four limbs uh, by uh, the goat, the lizard, the frog, and the bird. Um, the fish, although it's got fins, um, it doesn't possess true limbs like these other animals. And so from an evolutionary perspective, uh, since all four animals share four limbs, then all of them share a common ancestor with some original group that evolved that trait. Remember, that's Darwin's hypothesis, that this trait is modified um, uh, over time. So the lungfish then, uh, it would become our most primitive animal in our suite. Now, that uh, doesn't mean that this group necessarily went extinct. Uh, since we have modern lungfish today, and that's actually the picture that we have, uh, that don't possess four limbs, then evolutionary scientists assume that this group continued to evolve in other ways. Now, in order to find the next evolutionary group, what we want to do is we want to find a trait that three of the four remaining animals share. And it turns out that the goat, the uh, lizard, and the bird all use amniotic eggs when reproducing. So amniotic eggs uh, possess a series of uh, fluid-filled uh, membranes, and uh, those membranes permit the embryo to survive outside of water. Uh, the frog, uh, well, it doesn't have uh, those kinds of eggs, and so it's restricted to watery environments. So then the ancestor uh, to the frog becomes our next uh, most primitive group, and the amniotic egg then becomes our next evolved trait. We call those evolved traits synapomorphies. And uh, those synapomorphies then belong to the goat, the lizard, and the bird. And of course, once that trait has evolved, it continues uh, in the descendants to the right. 
So again, that doesn't mean, of course, that the group containing the frog goes extinct. Uh, it continues to evolve in lots of other ways. To find the next trait then, we again need to look at um, a major trait shared by two of the three animals that are left. And it turns out that the ancestors to birds and lizards had two holes in their head right behind the orbit. The goat, however, only has one hole behind the orbit. And animals with one hole, we call them synapsids. Uh, syn means uh, together and apsid means circle, so, uh, so together circle. Uh, lizards and, all, uh, and birds are called diapsids because their ancestors uh, had two holes or two circles uh, behind the orbit. So having two holes then uh, becomes our next evolutionary trait or synapomorphy. Now again, that doesn't mean that ancestors uh, to the goat didn't evolve anymore. In fact, if we remain on this particular evolutionary uh, branch as it goes up, we will eventually come to humans, um, the trait that separates uh, the goats from the humans being intelligence. Now things get a little complicated here. Remember that the last synapomorphy was the amniotic egg. Uh, because that is a derived or evolved trait, the synapomorphy, then all of the descendants, that's the animals to the right, are supposed to have that trait. But having one hole behind the orbit wasn't a primitive trait. The primitive condition that actually started off in the fish was no holes behind the orbit. It was kind of a solid skull with just an orbit. Uh, these animals are called anapsids. Uh, so the A meaning no, uh, and apsid meaning circle, or no holes. So where on our clade then did the single hole evolve if our primitive condition was actually no holes? Well, it must have evolved probably along this branch here somewhere, and that means that all of the descendants along this evolutionary path should possess a single hole behind the orbit from this point on, and in fact, this uh, line becomes the mammalian line. Now, back to our kind of main branch here. So since lizards don't have feathers, then the final evolutionary step is, of course, feathers. Now notice that the bird, it retains all of the primitive features from its evolutionary past. So it has a backbone, it has jaws, two eyes, has four legs, uh, or four limbs, I should say, uh, an amniotic egg, and two holes in its skull. And it will then pass on all of these primitive traits uh, to its descendants, as well as this new trait, which of course is the feather. So all of this is phylogenetics. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about phylogeny. And what we've just created is an evolutionary tree that indicates closeness of relationships. Now this particular tree is called a clade because all the organisms are united by um, descent from the lungfish. Now it's important to keep in mind that phylogenetics and these trees do have lots and lots of problems. Consider the holes in the back of the skulls. So evolutionists believe that the ancestors to the lungfish and the frog had no holes behind the orbit. Animals with this trait are called anapsids. Of course, like I said, A meaning no, apsid meaning circle, or no circle or no holes. So in the evolutionary story, the mammals, uh, like the goat, evolved a single hole and two holes therefore developed over here. But there are anomalies. And turtles, for example, don't have any holes behind the orbit, even though they are reptiles and at first thought should belong on this branch here along with the lizard. And that presents problems when creating a clade. Think about it. In the evolutionary story, the anapsid or the no hole condition went away with the evolution uh, of one and two holes, both here and here. Yet the turtle is a reptile, like the lizard, and should have two holes. And that means really one of two things. Number one, uh, the ancestors to the turtle evolved before this point, or number two, the turtle lost uh, their holes along this path here. Now remember, uh, these holes in the skull are heavily used by evolutionary scientists to establish what is and what is not primitive. Now the problem with option one, putting the turtle's ancestors here 
or, or here or here, is that uh, that would mean that uh, the reptilian features that are common to turtles and to the lizards over here had to evolve twice. That's a lot of features that evolved twice at two different times. Now Darwin say that option two is more parsimonious because to lose two holes is less complicated. Fair enough. But this phenomenon uh, it, it called convergence, it isn't a rare occurrence. So this paper published in 2019, for example, documents the overlap that these holes have uh, with different evolutionary clades. Uh, they make this quite clear when they say uh, different clades can transform to similar morphotypes. That's talking about the holes in the back of the skull. Just looking at the diagram describes the plasticity that exists between anapsids, synapsids, and diapsids. It's just not that simple. But convergence doesn't just stop with the holes in the back of the head. Uh, complex eyes that see images supposedly evolved up to 19 different times. You know, as such, evolutionary scientists, they don't use this particular trait to determine an evolutionary connection. But how does the scientist know that a certain feature has evolved once or multiple different times? If multiple different features evolve multiple times, and they do, then there is just no way to make any sense of these evolutionary trees when they try to connect all of life to a single common ancestor. And by the way, when I say they do evolve multiple times, I'm talking in an evolutionary paradigm. Now, having said all of that, phylogenetic clades uh, have revealed some weak areas in a creationist model. Take mammals, for example. Mammals do seem to be a real grouping of organisms that are related by common features. The use of phylogenetic trees has shown that some mammals uh, do tend to be more similar to each other than to other mammals. So as an example, uh, looking at the anatomy of a human, a gorilla, and a dog. Um, when we look at the human and the gorilla, their anatomy, their parts, the way the bones uh, are uh, bent or straight, uh, the way the skull is shaped, that anatomy and those parts, they're more similar to each other than either is to a dog. A dog seems to be very different, has different parts, the bones are shaped differently, and even the behavior of a dog is different. And so um, what do we call this space? This space between a similarity between the human anatomy and the gorilla or a, or a primate anatomy and the dissimilarity you get with that dog. Why is it that the dog seems to be very different than either the gorilla or the human? And that's a really good question, and we don't have time to answer it right now. Uh, I will provide a solution uh, in part two, so make sure you watch that. So um, uh, that's all for now. Uh, don't forget, we have the website, www.creationunfolding.com. We've got the Facebook page. Rest of the YouTube videos, please hit the subscribe button because there'll be more videos coming. Um, and of course, there's the book, Creation Unfolding, A New Perspective on Ex Nihilo, where I look at uh, new ways of trying to understand mature creationism. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.